We're now coming to questions to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, on behalf of David Davis, who is virtual, I ask the Prime Minister about his engagements. Question one to the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Let's head to South End. Sir David Amos. Next month, a book which I have written called Eyes and Ears, A Survivor's Guide to Westminster, will be published, part of which covers Brexit. And yes, by inference, everyone will be in the book. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the last general election was not fought on how political parties might handle the coronavirus pandemic, but was categorically about ensuring that the result of the 2016 referendum was implemented in full. Will my right honourable friend confirm that that is what he intends to see happen? Prime Minister. I, I can indeed, my, Mr Speaker, and I congratulate my uh, right honourable friend on uh, his, uh, his new book, and I can assure him that uh, this country has not only left the European Union, uh, but on January the 1st we will take back full control of our money, our borders and our laws. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, this is a crucial moment if we are to gain control of the virus. Yet for eight days, nearly 16,000 positive tests were missed by the Government. That means about 48,000 contacts were not traced. As of yesterday, thousands had still not been reached. Does the Prime Minister accept that this very basic mistake has put lives at risk? Uh, Mr Speaker, this is a, certainly a problem that uh, we have fixed. The, the computer glitch and error that uh, he refers to has been addressed. All the 16,000 that he refers to uh, have in fact got their, uh, test, their positive test results and should be self-isolating. And as soon as we became aware of the, uh, of the missing data, we brought in 800 people to, uh, to chase up uh, those, uh, those index cases and uh, we continue to chase their contacts, Mr Speaker. And I think it will be for the uh, reassurance of the House and the, and the country that the, the data points, the, the missing data points, do not, uh, now that we look at them, uh, change in any way our assessment of the epidemiology, the spread of the, uh, of the disease. And uh, that's why uh, we continue with our package to uh, suppress the virus, uh, not just nationally, uh, but locally uh, and regionally as well. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, this isn't just a technical issue, it's a human issue. And the attempted reassurance by the Prime Minister just doesn't wash. In Greater Manchester, some of the missing cases date back to September the 18th. That's two and a half weeks ago with three very serious consequences. It's now much harder to contact people after so long, the contacts of the 16,000. Even if they're contacted successfully, for many, the self-isolation period has already expired. And thirdly, important decisions on local restrictions were made using the wrong data. £12 billion has been invested in this system, and yet a basic Excel error brings it down. No wonder it's been described as intergalactic incompetence. So why, at this crucial moment, did it take so long to catch this error and to address it? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, you can't have it both ways. You can't call it a, a human error and a, a basic Excel uh, error. And uh, let, me, let me just uh, remind the House of what I've, and the All Right Honourable Gentleman, of what I've just said, because the crucial thing is that, uh, yes, of course there has been an error, but the data points that uh, we're looking at do not change, the, 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 the cases that we're looking at don't change the basic distribution of the disease. And I think it's very important for people to understand, because that, that's really what he was, I think, trying to, to drive at. And although the cases in the country are considerably up across the country this week on last week, the uh, seven-day statistics, Mr Speaker, show that uh, there are now 497 cases per 100,000 in Liverpool, 522 
cases per 100,000 uh, in Manchester, 422 in, in Newcastle. And the key point, Mr Speaker, there is that the local uh, regional approach combined with the national measures remains correct, I think, because uh, two-thirds of those admitted into hospital on Sunday uh, were in the northwest, uh, the northeast and, and Yorkshire. So that's why I think uh, that approach continues to be correct. Mr Speaker, the, the Prime Minister says it doesn't alter the basic distribution, yet thousands of people have been walking around while they should have been self-isolating. It patently has an effect on the basic distribution. If this was an isolated example, I think the British people might understand. But there's a pattern here on care homes, protective equipment, exams, testing. The Prime Minister ignores the warning signs, hurtles towards a car crash, then looks in the rear mirror and says, what's all that about? It's quite literally government in hindsight. Today, today, today is a hundred days, Mr Speaker, since the first local restrictions were introduced. Twenty local areas in England have been under restrictions for two months. Prime Minister, in 19 of those 20 areas, the infection rates have gone up. In Rosendale and Hindburn, they've gone up tenfold. Yet all the Prime Minister has to say is, it's too early to say if restrictions are working. But it's obvious that something's gone wrong here. So what's the Prime Minister going to do about it? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, as he knows, we're continuing to, continuing to provide support, um, £5 billion pounds of support for the, uh, for the North West and North East, uh, for the lockdowns, that the, the extra restrictions that they're experiencing. And uh, we, we will continue to to support all areas across the country that have to go into, into local measures. Now, two weeks ago, I set out that strategy. I said uh, that we would go forward with both with national measures uh, and uh, such as intensifying the rule of six, making sure that we, uh, we enforce the, the rule of six. Two weeks ago, Mr Speaker, he supported it. In fact, I think he went on the, the Nick Ferrari show saying, that, yeah, I support the rule of six. Yes, I do. Uh, yet last night, Mr Speaker, uh, the Labour Party abstained on the rule of six. He asks what we're doing uh, to enforce well, he asked what we're doing to enforce local measures. He can't even be bothered to get his own side to support them himself. Mr Speaker, for the Prime Minister's benefit, let me take this slowly for him. We, su we, we, we support measures to protect health. We want track and trace to work. But the government is messing it up and it's our duty to point it out. Let's get back to the questions. Because these are not trick questions. I've got the figures here, Prime Minister. In Bury, when restrictions were introduced, the infection rate was around 20 per 100,000. Today it's 266. In Burnley, it was 21 per 100,000 when restrictions were introduced. Now it's 434. In Bolton, it was 18 per 100,000. Now it's 255. The Prime Minister really needs to understand that local communities are angry and frustrated. So will he level with the people of Bury, Burnley and Bolton and tell them what does he actually think the problem is here? Mr Speaker, the problem is, alas, that the disease continues to spread in the way that uh, I described to the House earlier. And the, the figures that he gives are, are no surprise since they're fundamentally repetitions of what I've, uh, what I've already told uh, the House. And uh, what, we are doing, what we are doing is a combination of national and local measures, which one week, Mr Speaker, he comes to this House and supports, and the next week, uh, mysteriously, he decides to whisk uh, his support away. And he cannot even be bothered to mobilise his own, his own benches to support something as fundamental as the rule of six, which he himself said only three weeks ago that he supported. He cannot continue to have it both ways. Does he support the rule of six, yes or no? Yes. But the government... The gov yes. But if the, if the Prime Minister can't see, if Prime Minister can't see and hear local communities when they say the infection rate has gone up tenfold under restrictions and he doesn't realise that's a problem, then that is part of the problem. <laughs> Mr Speaker, there's a further cause of anger. Prime Minister, if you actually listen to the question, we might get on better. 
there's further cause of anger. Lack of clarity about why particular restrictions have been introduced. For example, in the Prime Minister's own local authority, Hillingdon, today there are 62 cases per 100,000, yet no local restrictions. But in 20 local areas across England, restrictions were imposed when, infe when infection rates were much lower. In Kirklees, it was just 29 per 100,000. Local communities, Prime Minister, genuinely don't understand these differences. Can he please explain for them? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think actually that he's heard from uh, me and heard repeatedly from the government uh, why we're bringing in differentiated uh, local restrictions. I've just given the figures for uh, the North East and North West. I wish I could pretend, Mr Speaker, that uh, everything was going to be rosy in, uh, in, in the Midlands or indeed in London, Mr Speaker, where, alas, we are also seeing infections rise. And that's why we need a concerted national effort. We need to follow the guidance. We need hands, face, space, get a test uh, if you have symptoms, and obey the rule of six, Mr Speaker. And I, I, I think it quite extraordinary that uh, the right honourable gentleman has just said that he, he, personally, he personally supports the rule of six while allowing his entire party to abstain. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister can't explain why an area goes into restriction. He can't explain what the different restrictions are. He can't explain how restrictions end. This is getting ridiculous. Next week, this House will vote on whether to approve the 10pm rule. The Prime Minister knows that there are deeply held views across the country in different ways on this. One question is now screaming out. Is there a scientific basis for the 10pm rule? The public deserve to know. Parliament deserves to know. If there is, why doesn't the government do itself a favour and publish it? If not, why doesn't the government review the rule? So will the Prime Minister commit... <laughs> Will the Prime Minister commit to publishing the scientific basis for the 10 pm rule before this House votes on it next Monday? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the basis on which we set out the curtailment of hospitality was the basis on which he accepted it two weeks ago, uh, and that is to reduce the spread of the virus, Mr. Speaker. And that is, that is our objective. That's why we introduced. The rule of six, Mr. Speaker, which again uh, he supported only two weeks ago, and yet, and yet, uh, last night uh, they have said, and today they're, today they're withdrawing uh, their support for other restrictions. What kind of a signal, Mr. Speaker, does this send to the people of the country about the robustness of the Labour Party and their willingness to enforce the restrictions, Mr. Speaker? That's not new leadership. That's no leadership. And we, we, are, we, are taking, we are taking the tough decisions that are necessary, imposing restrictions, which we don't want to do, Mr Speaker, but imposing restrictions locally and nationally to fight the virus, to keep young people, keep kids in education and keep the bulk of our economy moving. And, uh, and at the same time, Mr Speaker, we are getting on with our agenda, our lifetime skills guarantee, our green industrial revolution, by which we will take this country forward and build back better. John Stevenson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, two of the government's central policies are levelling up and housing. Carlisle and Cumbria need further infrastructure investment, but it does have the capacity for increased housing development, especially with the garden village to the south of Carlisle. The Government therefore has the opportunity to help with both its levelling up agenda while reducing the strain on housing in the south of England. To achieve this, the Government could move parts of uh, Government departments out of London to the provinces, but not Manchester and uh, Leeds. Would the Prime Minister therefore let me know when he proposes to move a Government department to Carlisle? <laughs> oh, well, Mr Speaker, I have spent uh, at least one very happy night out in Carlisle. And, uh, and uh, I know it's a wonderful place, and I will certainly look with, uh, with uh, interest at the uh, Honourable Gentleman's suggestion. We do have uh, an ambitious programme to disperse, uh, to unite and level up across our country. We now go up to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week is Challenge Poverty Week, and I'd like to thank all organisations across Scotland and the United Kingdom helping families through the most difficult of times. Their dedication and commitment should inspire every single one of us in the fight to end poverty. With mass unemployment looming, having the right social security measures in place to help families over the long term is vital. 
Mr Speaker, the Chancellor has so far refused to commit to make the £20 universal credit uplift permanent. This means that 16 million people face losing an income equivalent of £1,040 overnight. Will the Prime Minister now commit to making the £20 uplift to universal credit permanent? Mr Speaker, can I thank the uh, right honourable gentleman and, and uh, I, I welcome his support for, for universal credit, which uh, this uh, side of the House introduced. I'm proud uh, that we've been able to uprate it in the way that, uh, in the way that we have and uh, we, will continue, we will continue to support people across uh, the, the country uh, with the biggest cash increase in the national living wage uh, this year and uh, the result of, the, of universal credit uh, so far has been that there are 200,000 fewer people in absolute poverty now than there were in 2010. I, I know that he wasn't perhaps a keen supporter of universal credit uh, when it was introduced, but I welcome his support today. Returning to Scotland with Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, one of these days the Prime Minister might even consider to ask the question. It was about making the £20 increase permanent. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation have painted a very clear picture for his government. Strip the £20 universal credit away and 700,000 more people, including 300,000 children, could move into poverty. 500,000 more people could end up in severe poverty, more than 50% below the poverty line. The Resolution Foundation have called the £20 uplift a living standards lifeline for millions of families during the pandemic. Challenge Poverty Week is a moment for all of us to take unified action against poverty. The Prime Minister has an opportunity here and now. Will he do the right thing? Will he answer the question? And will we make the £20 uplift permanent? Mr Speaker, I, I, I don't want in any way to uh, uh, under, uh, estimate the importance of what Ryan Jam is, is saying. Uh, it is vital that we tackle poverty in, in this country. and That's why this government is so proud of what we did with the, uh, the national living wage. And uh, what I can tell him on universal credit is that we're putting another £1.7 billion into universal credit by 2023-2024. And if that doesn't give him the answer uh, that he wants, uh, then, uh, then he can ask again next week. But we will continue. We will continue to support people, families across this country. And we will continue to spend £95 billion a year in this country on working age welfare. But the best thing we can do uh, for families, for people on universal credit, is to get this virus down, get our economy moving again, and get them back into well paid, high skilled jobs. And that's what we're going to do. Bench. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. The review announced by the Prime Minister into transport connections across the Union will be hugely welcome in Wales, where the public wants a new M4 relief road a cut in railway journey times in North Wales and in Clwyd South an upgrade to the A483 A5. Does the Prime Minister agree that this review demonstrates his government's commitment to building back better in a strong United Kingdom? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I thank my honourable friend who represents that constituency I once fought for. Uh, so, uh, so well, he represents it well. I don't think I fought for it but very well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 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 and the the, the A four eight three A five connection that he that he mentions, I, I know well, and uh, I know that Sir Peter uh, will certainly be looking at that uh, scheme and many others in his union connectivity review. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister is passionate about the Union, as am I. And in welcoming the review of connectivity uh, within the Union, as the Honourable Member has just mentioned, would the Prime Minister agree that whilst it is good to consider connectivity across the Irish Sea, it would be devastating to Northern Ireland to have barriers to trade in the Irish Sea? And in the remaining days of the negotiations with the European Union, can I urge the Prime Minister to hold firm and to commit to protecting Northern Ireland's place within the internal market of the United Kingdom by ensuring full and unfettered access for our businesses uh, and businesses who trade in either direction and uh, for the consumers who benefit from Northern Ireland being an integral part of the United Kingdom? 
Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I think that uh, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman is entirely right, and, uh, and I'm sure his words will have uh, been heard loud and clear with, with our friends on the, in, in Brussels. Uh, but just in case uh, they haven't, of course, we have uh, the excellent uh, UK Internal Market Bill uh, to prevent such barriers from arising. Christian Wakeford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is right to be talking about le levelling up and building back better, but building back fairer. Can my right honourable friend outline what support is available for towns that haven't received any towns or high street funding in recent tranches, such as Radcliffe and Presswich, in my constituency? And will he join me as part of my campaign to support local shops by congratulating the winner of my independent shop competition? The only way is melt by Tracy in Radcliffe. <laughs> Yes, Mr Speaker, I, I can indeed uh, confirm to my honourable friend that uh, in addition to the particular support that he, he mentions, we're uh, uh, directing another £160 billion uh, of support for, uh, for business and uh, local authorities and business improvement uh, districts, and I'm more than happy uh, to uh, congratulate The Only Way Is Melt by Tracy in Radcliffe. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Across the UK, our universities are struggling to contain the coronavirus, with some 5,000 cases uh, reported in recent weeks. Our communities deserve better and more local and immediate access to testing facilities. But in Leamington, I'm told that Deloitte's will not deliver on their, their testing facility until the end of this month, some four weeks after 7,000 students will have arrived back in the town of Leamington. My question is simple. Was the government not expecting students to return to university? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, it's, it's very important that students should return to university in the, in the way that they have, and uh, I want to thank uh, the overwhelming majority of students for the way that they've complied with the guidance, complied with the, uh, the regulations, and, uh, and are doing what they can to, to suppress it. Clearly, there are particular problems uh, in some parts of the country, uh, which we've discussed at length already, and uh, we will be pursuing the measures that we've outlined to bring them down in those areas, and I hope that, I hope that he will support them. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, in his uh, statement on the 22nd of September, my right honourable friend said that the Chancellor and the Culture Secretary are working urgently on a support package for sports clubs that rely upon paying spectators. He also recognised the similar difficulties facing the conference and exhibition industry. I agree with his analysis, and that sector is really important in Harrogate and Nesborough. So could he tell the House when that package will be coming forward, and will it include the conference and exhibition industries? Mm. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, uh, the, I, I totally agree with my, my honourable friend about the importance of the conference and exhibition industry. It's, I think, worth about £90 billion uh, to this country. It's of it's massive uh, importance. Uh, it was a very difficult decision to take to pause uh, conferences and and exhibitions. We want to get them open as fast as, as possible. Uh, we will, of course, they've, they've had a lot of support, as I've, as I've indicated earlier, the £190 billion package is there to help businesses of all kinds. But the best way forward, Mr Speaker, is to get uh, the kind of testing systems that will enable not just conferences and uh, businesses of that kind, but uh, all types, even theatres, uh, to reopen and get back to, to normality. That's what we're aiming for. Mr. Yes. Speaker, yesterday the Chancellor suggested that those who are musicians or work in the creative industries who can't work because of COVID restrictions, and, and I quote, should find new opportunities. Can the Prime Minister tell? Can the Prime Minister tell the House? Can the Prime Minister tell the House what jobs the hundreds of thousands of people, including hundreds in my constituency who work in the fastest-growing part of our economy, should be doing? Because the answer from the Chancellor of go away, find a new job, you're not our problem, simply isn't good enough for these t thousands of people who are truly talented and world leading within this country. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, that is simply not what the Chancellor yeah. said. And, uh, I, and my right honourable friend, the, the Chancellor, has already uh, provided £1.7 billion of support for the creative culture uh, industries uh, for sport, and, and uh, we will ensure, and he's right by the way, uh, to identify the massive, the massive economic value 
of those industries, and that's why we are supporting them uh, through these tough times, and that's why we're working to get the virus down, get our economy back to normal as fast as we possibly can, and I hope that he will support our strategy. Let's head up to Shesham with Dame Cheryl Gillan. Dame Cheryl. Um, Mr Speaker, building on that, can I welcome the Prime Minister's excellent Conservative Party conference speech yesterday, which outlined his vision of our government's plans for a green economy which will create hundreds of thousands of jobs. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the merits of his green economy proposals extend far beyond energy production and also include the preservation of our green spaces? As the UK prepares to host COP26, will the Prime Minister show the international community the way by committing the UK to championing greater protections for our chalk streams and extend his vision to redesignate the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty as a national park following Julian Glover's recommendation in the Landscape Review. Minister. Well, I thank uh, my right honourable friend. Of course, we are committed to protecting areas such as the uh, Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty. I understand that DEFRA are actually considering each of the recommendations in Julian Glover's uh, review and following the, the correct procedure. But I hope uh, my honourable friend will also uh, 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 acknowledge, or, or I hope she knows, that this government is also leading the way globally in protecting uh, biodiversity, in protecting habitat, in protecting species, and that's what we're going to be doing both in the, in the G7 and in the, the, the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow next year. Hey, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Unemployment has already doubled to 8% in my constituency this year. The end of furlough is leading to thousands more job losses in the next three weeks, and the Merseyside local lockdown puts 58,000 jobs in what was a booming hospitality sector in the immediate firing line. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that tighter local lockdown restrictions, like those imposed on Merseyside, should trigger automatic government support for local business and support schemes to prevent this economic carnage worsening? And will he commit today to, to uh, such a targeted support package? Uh, for Merseyside, as a matter of urgency, please. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I share uh, her feelings about the loss of jobs and the potential loss of jobs. It's wretched uh, that we have to, uh, to do this. Uh, and uh, I can, all I can tell her is that we've already allocated £2.6 billion uh, pounds to, the, to the North West, and uh, Nosley in particular, her constituency, uh, as she knows, has had uh, £12 million, pounds, uh, Liverpool uh, another £40 40, uh, million. Pounds. But we will continue to provide uh, support across the country uh, to put our arms around uh, jobs and livelihoods in the country as, we, as we've done throughout this pandemic. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I welcome the Prime Minister's confirmation of the 40 new hospitals this decade, including the yeah, yeah, yeah. Mid and North Hampshire proposal, which will serve many of my constituents in East Hampshire? And does he agree with me that this is also a good opportunity to optimise healthcare provision across the wider area, making full use of our valued community hospitals like Alton Hospital? Yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. I can uh, confirm to my right honourable friend that we're, re we're building a new hospital at Basingstoke and North Hampshire Hospital, major refurbishment at uh, the Royal Hampshire Hospital in uh, Winchester, and we will continue to support Hampshire Hospital's uh, NHS Foundation Trust as they develop their plans, uh, including uh, such local infrastructure as Alton Community Hospital. Twist. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Restrictions in the North East around opening times and socialising with other households are limiting custom, reducing income and making it uneconomical for many businesses to stay open, including those in my constituency of Bladen. So what assurance can the Prime Minister give uh, myself and the local authorities uh, that he will provide the necessary finance to mitigate their income and retain the 80,000 people employed in the hospitality and retail sectors? And will he meet local leaders to discuss their requests for this support. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, she's uh, she's entirely right to 
to raise the issue of uh, support for hospitality. We'll continue to do uh, in areas that face uh, tougher restrictions. Uh, we'll continue to do uh, whatever uh, we can to, to support, and you'll be familiar with the, the big package that we've already uh, brought in. But I think that the party opposite does really need to decide uh, whether they're in favour of the plan to reduce transmission, to bear down on the virus, or, or not. Because if they are, if they are, then I'm afraid they must recognise that there will also be consequences of that plan. So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister's new lifetime skills guarantee is hugely welcome. Peterborough already has a new specialist university plan specialising in manufacturing, in technology, science and engineering, thanks in part to the government's funding of a £14.6 million new research super hub in our city centre, bringing about highly paid jobs to our city centre. Does he agree that it's vital to include adult learners in our vision for further education and universities so that people in working cities like Peterborough have the right skills to succeed? Uh, yes, I thank my honourable friend because uh, it is indeed part of our plan to fuel a green economic recovery that we put £14 million from the Getting Building fund into uh, Peterborough to accelerate the delivery of a key a new educational and research facility and we're also giving Peterborough uh, another, one another £1 million pound, uh, of accelerated payment for investment into capital projects to enable Peterborough to build back better. Stephen Timms. Thank you Mr Speaker. The Government was right to increase universal credit by £20 a week to help families with the extra costs of the pandemic but at the moment that increase is due to be removed next April. He's declined today to commit to making it permanent, but will he at least agree with me that it would be unthinkable to cut everybody's benefit before the pandemic is over? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, of course we keep all these things under constant review, but I'm glad that he too uh, joins the, uh, the benches opposite in uh, support and approval now for what the Government has done with universal credit. Yeah. David Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just 12% of our journalists and our chief execs come from a working class background and just 6% of our doctors and our barristers do. Does my honourable friend agree with me we need a renewed focus on social mobility from all institutions so that we make much better use of all of the country's talent? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, that is exactly what this government was elected to do in 2019. We were elected on a manifesto not just to build 40 more hospitals, now 48, uh, to put 20,000 more police on our streets, but to unite our country and level up across our country and unleash the potential of the whole of the United Kingdom and that is what we are going to do. I will, I will Thank you, Mr Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister said that it would be easy to build new homes without destroying our green spaces. Now, Many constituents in my part of Coventry are concerned, concerned that the government is yet again relying on dodgy figures to trample on our green spaces and build unaffordable, low-quality homes in its place. Now, As Coventry is running out of brownfield sites, precisely where does he expect these new homes to be built? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, there is uh, a, abundant brownfield space across the whole of the UK. And I, I speak as somebody who used to be the planning authority uh, for London, and I know, uh, I know whereof I, I speak. The, the opportunity is there. In many cases, the restrictions are, are, are caused by cumbersome planning procedures, but they are also caused, Mr Speaker, by the inability of young people to get the mortgages they want and to buy the homes that they want. And that's why, that's why we are bringing forward our, our fixed rate mortgages for 95% of the value of the property to help young people onto the property ladder. We're going to turn generation rent into generation buy, Mr Speaker. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am suspending the House for three minutes. Order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.